Most of the time when you purchase 48 volt lithium batteries, they're gonna cost you an arm and a leg. In this case, we have a 48 volt lithium battery made for server racks. Now it's a used battery. It's got a tough steel case and it is really heavy. We're gonna bust it open and find out what it takes to use it in a home power wall backup system. Here we go. Hi everybody, I'm David. Welcome to my channel where I like to DIY renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. This video, we're gonna bust open this really heavy server rack battery. Now, this thing is over 90 pounds. It looks like 94 pounds for this LG pack. The cells inside here are arranged as 14S, which means they're going to work really well with 48 volt inverters and 48 volt charge controllers. Now this one is used and it's gonna have some degradation. We're gonna find out how much. I purchased two of these packs from Battery Hookup using my discount code, which is DAVIDPAWS, and that gets you 10% off any of your orders from Battery Hookup. You could stack one on top of the other, probably floor to ceiling, without worrying about crushing the one underneath. According to Battery Hookup's website, this has about 2 2.2 kilowatt hours remaining out of the original 3.2 kilowatt hours. Now we're going to test that and confirm it. Now this pack has a maximum continuous discharge of 100 amps, maximum continuous charge of 50 amps according to Battery Hookup's website. So we'll be using a 100 amp BMS with it, 22 and a quarter to the outside of the orange plastic. We have about 20 inches from the outside of the handle to the outside of the handle over here. And standing tall, it looks about four and seven eighths, almost five inches tall. Now this is the only spot where we had some damage from shipping. Now this unit was palletized really well. It looked, it had about a dozen straps on it. Battery hookup tried their best. Not even the studs got damaged or any of the plastic is cracked. So, you know, I mean, shipping happens. And we have 53.3 volts at the outside terminals. So if there's a BMS inside, it's not shut off. But I don't know exactly what's built into this, so we're gonna find out. We're gonna take off all these Phillips head screws and get the top cover off this battery. There we go. Inside the cover, it looks like there is a bunch of open cell padding. According to Battery Hookup's website, half of this is a 7S and half is a 7S. So if you wanted to use them as 24 volts, that should be possible. I wanna take off these orange covers and I'm gonna to have to slip something in here so as not to break the little tab that's in the inside. I'm gonna try this very little flathead screwdriver. Oh, broke one of them. <laughs> so if this is the main negative, it looks like it comes up to this side, it must travel through. Then we have a positive bus bar over here, which jumps to the negative side and then the main positive. I'm gonna take this 300 amp fuse off and these might be 10 millimeter. Let's go find out. Yep, 10 millimeter. Wow. That's quite the setup. Look how thick that copper is. <laughs> 26.7. And this half reads 26.7, oh, 6.9. Wow, nearly perfect, that's awesome, well balanced. A BMS like this that I'll be adding, this has protection circuits built in. So if something goes wrong with the cells, this BMS will shut off the pack. And that does that with little MOSFETs inside here. But this unit doesn't look like it has a traditional BMS inside. It looks like this is just a communication port where it's taking the information of the cell voltages, uh, probably some thermistors built in, and it's gonna send that data packet up to the higher level computer and say whether it's good or bad. And if something's bad, then the higher level computer could shut down. It looks like a couple of Phillips head screws and then a uh, bolt up top and we should be able to get this unit out. I'm gonna call this a BMU or battery management unit. Okay, so there we go. If anybody's interested on the part number on that, uh, actually, let's go ahead and take it apart. Looks like we have some Phillips head screws and we can go inside and look at the uh, circuit board. Okay, so let's take a look inside. Now, I'm not a computer engineer, so I don't know exactly what we're looking at here. 
but to me, these little things look like they're probably resistors. A pair of resistors for each cell, and this board is keeping the cells balanced. So this is a balance board and a communication board, but it's not a safety protection board. So this, is, this doesn't cut off the battery pack itself. Looks like our two halves are separated right down the middle. Now thank you to you guys on YouTube as well as a few people on the Facebook group who've already taken these apart. They've identified that not every bolt needs to be removed to take the cell modules out of the housing. Uh, so that will save me some time. So I'm going to flip this over and let's take a look at which bolts look like they go all the way through and which ones might just be for the plastic housing. There's a threaded stud right here. So this bolt is going to go all the way through and screw to the housing, but this bolt has no nut on the back side right there. So this one doesn't come out. This will be just used to hold together the plastic housing. Looks like there's even, feels like aluminum. Let's see, yeah. So they have an aluminum sleeve inside the plastic. That should be all of them. Let's go ahead and lift it out. Let's see if we can lift it up now of here. Oh, I see that I missed a couple of Phillips screws. There we go. Well, fit together like a puzzle. So in the middle of this module, uh, it looks like there's some plastic covers here. So let's go ahead and pop them out. Okay, so we're seeing one side of the cells here. These wires come over here to a thermistor. So that's gonna tell us the temperature. You can see down into the cells. And over here, we're seeing half the cells. That's neat how they're oriented. Okay, let's flip it over. So that's all of four millivolts difference between them. It's pretty clear at this point that you don't have to pull it apart this far. Uh, you could leave this inside the tray with the sides attached, uh, but I'm interested in just how far we can take this apart. So let's keep going. I got the two copper bars off. Now I'm going to go through and remove these. And this little temperature sensor, it just pulls out from in between the cells. And these are just Phillips head screws, so take them off and then remove these little copper bars on each side. Well, that was pretty neat. These series connections can pop out like that. So now these are gonna be the cell tabs. In the interest of fun, let's keep going and we'll take these bolts out. Now the packs might expand and I might not be able to get them back together, but I'm willing to do it just because I'm so curious as to see exactly how they're built. Okay, here we go. Yep, quite a bit of expansion there. Boom. It looks like all the connections are being made right here in the middle. Inside, I can see two cells. So that means that this is a 4P. So there's two cells here and two cells here, all in parallel to this. If anybody wants to look that up, that means that I would guess these are 15 amp hour cells. If you have a unique application where you wanna take the individual cells apart and then reorient them into your own thing, you should be able to do that. You should be able to come in here and just pry up the tab and that'll break the spot weld. Looks like <laughs> that whole thing can come up. So all four cells have been paralleled here in the middle. So we have a negative and a positive. So we have a threaded nut in there. So it makes this, all, all these cell tabs are welded to this copper plate 
on both sides, giving you a threaded nut to connect to. So right now these get series connected, so positive to negative, positive to negative, positive to negative, and then opposite on the other side. Uh, potentially, you might be able to rotate this whole upper pack around. So if you oriented this whole thing around, so I'm taking this cell group and I'm rotating it, and it looks like it probably would work. Just like that. So right here I just flipped the top one, but you could see how that could just uh, parallel right there. So you could flip every other one and do one parallel connection down the whole line. And you could do that on each side. So right here you could parallel these, and all these silver tabs would line up, making all the parallels. So you could turn this whole thing into one giant uh, cell pack. This would be, what would that be, about one and a half kilowatt hours of a 1S. <laughs> That's so neat. Right now I'm just compressing the cells so that I can get them back into the case. When I saw that you could flip every other cell around, I got very excited and I wasn't making a whole lot of comprehensive sense trying to explain it. So I'm going to refilm that and put it up at the end of the video with an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, so stick around to the end if you want to see why I think turning the cells around makes a lot more sense if you're going to use these modules. We got the case back together exactly the way it was. The next thing to do is focus on attaching the BMS. So at this point, all you had to do was remove the lid and the BMU unit, which isn't necessary. But these are the voltage sense wires, which go to every positive of the cells. We need to get to these wires and then attach the BMS leads to it. When we go to attach all these wires, we don't want the wires attached to the BMS, just in case we short something. And this is clearly showing which one is the main negative and the main positive. I'm going to start by cutting away this extra sheath. All right, that's as far as we need to go with it. I don't need to take off any more than that. Because at this point, that will allow me to take this plastic uh, loom off. There we go. So with that out of the way, we now see that this is a temperature sensor, and we don't need the temperature sensor, so that's going to go away with this plug, which we don't need. But all these other wires, they go down to the voltage sense, so we're probably going to have a few that we don't need, uh, but most of these we will need. It's something to watch out for, you don't want to just go ahead and cut this whole thing, because you'll wind up shorting these wires out. Now because these wires run down to a ring terminal directly on the tab, what will happen is you'll burn out the wire somewhere between here and there, and then you'll have to take this whole module out to replace it. So I'm not going to do this uh, anything fancy here, I'm just pulling them off one at a time. And there we go. Now I'll take the temperature sensor off with the plug. We don't need that. And we're left with all these wires coming out and it looks great. Now this BMS wiring harness, this is all 24 gauge. It says 24 on the wire. Uh, this stuff looks a little bit thicker, so it might be 22 gauge. So we need to figure out which wire goes to which. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jam the main positive in here. That way the negative is free and we have 26.7. But now this hand is free. So what I'm going to do is check these individual leads until I find the 26.7. That way I know that I have found the main negative wire that goes all the way over to here. I happen to remember that when I took apart this module and checked the back side, there were two wires leading to the screw that was the main negative. And I just went through and checked every single one of them, and it was these two. The white wire is showing 26.7. Seven, and the blue wire is also showing the same, 26.7. So they're both connected to the same ring terminal back there. Uh, so in the interest of just keeping kind of things organized, what I'm going to do is use the white wire as the main negative. So since I don't need the blue wire, I'll cut the blue wire down a little bit 
and then just tape it over. So now I go back to my BMS harness and I have the main black wire right here. This is the main negative. So it needs to attach to the main negative of the LG server pack. So I'm going to take this white one and connect these two together. Let's see if I can trim it with a 20. Yep. This can be a very time consuming process doing all this wiring. To try to make it quicker for myself, I picked up these low melt solder connections. And I picked up a big pack of them. And I'll leave a affiliate link to these in the description below. Now I should be able to just use a heat gun and have that The next wire in the BMS harness is going to be this one. Now this needs to connect to the positive side of cell number one. This is the negative of cell number one. So what we need to do is switch our probes over. Now we'll jam in the negative probe. Just get it in there tight. And now with the positive probe, we're going to go through and check these until we can find one that reads about 3.8, which is about what we're at right now. But it'll be somewhere between 3 and 4.2. So we're going to go through and find one that reads 3.8, and we know that's the positive of the first cell. Here it is. So it's the brown one. So here's our brown wire. That's going to be the positive of the first cell. I'm going to take this little heat shrink solder connection and I'm going to slip it on down past the end. Now we'll take the BMS harness. We've already done the black wire, which is the main negative. Now we'll take the second wire in the harness. We'll slide it down through our fingers until we reach the end. Now we need to strip some of this insulation. We're now going to twist these together. Now I'll slide the heat shrink down. So we'll slide this down until the solder, so now the solder is over the middle of that twisted connection, and now we heat it. And you could actually see that, that solder flow inside the wires. Now we'll go back to this one and we'll give this a little tug now that it's cooled off. Yeah, it's not coming apart. So that's the procedure. It's boring, <laughs> but that's what we need to do. I noticed the main positive of this module also has two wires. We have 26.7 on the purple and 26.7 on the red with a white stripe. Now since I already have a red one over here, I'll fold back this red one with a white stripe and we'll keep just the purple. This uh, Tessa Loom Tape, and I'll leave a link to this in the description below if you want to get some. Now I'm not going to tape up more of this until I have the other side done, because I'll probably tape them together. But now we've protected all the splices leading back to the system. Now we just have the other half to do. At this point I've cut the plug off and we have all the wires exposed. I'm going to temporarily put this fuse back in place. That doesn't have to be on here very tight so I'll just put it on by hand. Now if you remember our last reading was 26.7. So the next reading should be about uh, 30 volts, something like that. So the brown one is the next one over that we need. So again, we'll just slip on our heat shrink. So we're going to go through and check these one at a time, make sure we haven't crossed anything. 3.8, 7.6. So we're just looking to make sure we go up by 3.8 every time without skipping any numbers. Make sure we haven't crossed our leads anywhere. This is important to do every time you make a new wiring harness before you plug this into the BMS. 
because if something's wrong, you could short the BMS. So it looks like we're all good. So now this is good to go. Move my board out of the way. Now the BMS has two things on here. We have a Charlie minus, and over here we have a Bravo minus. Now the Bravo is for the battery side. So this needs to go to these, this copper bar right here. So I can put it in a ring terminal and put it on that post. And then this is the side where we take off to all of our loads and charge controllers. Now I'm going to cram this BMS kind of down in this area so that it'll be hidden by the cover and it'll be nice. That way the output of this whole block is already protected. Now to put it in there, uh, I think I'm going to cut this piece of plastic from the BMU because it already lines up well for these two screw holes. And I'll use that as part of securing this. So I'm going to start nibbling away. I'm going to take away some of this plastic and I'm going to be checking the fit as I go. So I've been cutting this up and I think I'm onto something here as far as uh, mounting this BMS, but I'm finding that this little threaded stud back here is getting in my way. Now I don't need that anymore. That was part of holding in the end of the BMU that I just cut off. So I'm going to uh, see if I can break that off. I put the bolt back in place. Now underneath is this. See, a couple of little spot welds. There we go. There's the, the nut. Well, on the inside, so I think that'll probably work. Uh, so I'm gonna tape the BMS on here some more. Make sure it's nice and rigid and not gonna go anywhere. And then I'll cr I have to crimp on a splice to come over here to this lug for the B minus, and uh, this lug can just come out the way it is. So I melted the plastic a little bit. Next time I'm going to have to do all this outside of the plastic case. <laughs> I, I had already taped this up and I just didn't think it was going to melt that. <laughs> so I put some zip ties and heat shrink on there as a strain relief. Uh, so now we can tug on this, you know, if not go anywhere. So on this BMS, there are two temperature sensors. So I'm going to fish the temperature sensors down in between the cells. So here's the fuse and it gets secured with these serrated flanged head nuts. This is the welded stud that I broke off from the bottom, and it happens to be the same thread size. So I'm going to use a little Loctite and use this. To charge it, I'm going to be using this uh, boost converter. So I'm going to connect this Anderson plug to it, because that is what I currently have on the boost converter. I mentioned in a previous video, I have a collection of different <laughs> uh, plugs going on. So over here, we'll just throw this on. So I'm pulling power off of my big battery bank to this boost converter. I have it set to 10 amps and 58.8, which would be fully charged for this battery pack. 
Uh, so we're going into the BMS and right to the positive post over here. So let's go ahead and turn it on. So 10.5 amps on that side, we're coming in. I'm borrowing the Bluetooth dongle from my other battery because uh, battery hookup was sold out of the Bluetooth dongles for this. So let me borrow my wife's phone because uh, that's an Apple and we'll be able to check what the BMS is doing. Here's the app open connected to the Bluetooth dongle and the BMS so we can see what the cells are doing. Okay, it's been charging for a while and one cell is now balancing. So the way that this BMS is pre-configured from the factory is it'll start balancing when you're in a charging cycle and when you have more than a 30 millivolt difference. So you see when it pops over 30 millivolts, that's when it's balancing. And then when it drops below 30 millivolts, it stops balancing again. And this boost converter is not getting hot. I can touch it. I do have the fan running but it doesn't get hot when you're really close to the same voltage and right now my battery pack is at 53 volts you can see right there and I'm charging and it's currently at 55.7 yep, 55.8 uh, so the two voltages are very close to each other so there's not a whole lot of dissipated heat uh, when you have a wider range then it gets hot we're showing 58.83 on the BMS, and our highest cell is 4.224. Now it's important to note that this is actually fairly common. A lot of BMSs won't shut down until you hit 4.25 volts. This is 4.22 right now. So we haven't actually hit the BMS cutoff, and they allow that little bit extra for that balancing top end. Terrific, we're ready to start the discharge test. We have the battery, the BMS is still hooked up to the Bluetooth dongle, the app on the phone. We have our watt meter. This is going to tell us how many watt hours we pull. If you're curious how I built this, I have a video on it. Then we have an inverter, and the inverter is connected to two space heaters. And we have a few watt hours left over from the last time we used this. So I'm going to reset this, and I'm just grabbing the closest thing that's small. <laughs> we press and hold this little button. All right, we're completely zeroed out on everything. We have 58.7 volts. Uh, the switch is on, so we're using the battery to power this meter. Uh, we're currently connected here and here. So let's go ahead and turn it on. We'll start with the switch right there. Uh-oh. Oh, nope, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I was worried that I just fried my inverter. I forgot that I added a circuit breaker on the back side of my meter. All right, so we turn the circuit breaker on, turn that on. <laughs> Woo! That was close. And the space heaters are now on. All right. <laughs> All right, let's see what we're doing. Uh, the cells are fairly well balanced. Uh, if I was to allow this more time to balance out, it could get them a little bit better. Uh, but this will probably take, I'm guessing, around four hours to do the discharge. So we'll find out. There is an hour meter here, so we'll be able to see exactly how long it took. Five hours would be the ideal time frame for a discharge test. But we'll see how many kilowatt hours we get out of this battery. All right, we're at the three-hour mark, and we've done 1.67 kilowatt hours. It's only been 20 minutes since I last checked. Uh, and what's interesting is when you get down towards the bottom of the voltage curve, how much more deviation you start to have between the cells. We're now at 170 uh, millivolt delta between the highest and lowest. And so you start to see which cell groups are the weakest when you get into this down at the bottom. And that's because uh, we top balance the cells or the BMS. Uh, right here is programmed to top balance and so then when you get towards the bottom you uh, start to uh, find out which cells are the weaker ones and so we already have the weakest cell here is at 3.3 so when I put this into service uh, in my own home that means that I'm going to be using these numbers 
uh, 34 amp hours uh, for the programming. Uh, so I'm going to assume that I have a usable 1.8 kilowatt hours out of this pack. Now I'm going to keep the test going and find out what our total is, but I don't want the weakest cell group going under 3.3. Uh, it was actually the BMS that shut off. You see the under voltage protection there. So our grand total is 1.93 kilowatt hours or 36.2 amp hours. We are fully charged once again. The cells are a little bit more balanced. What I've been doing is a few short cycles right at the top end between 4 volts and 4.2 volts per cell. And so we've been able to balance out better. All right, so at this point, we're done charging this. We're going to try one more discharge test, the Max Oak Blue Eddy. So I'm going to use this as a load because it has an MPPT input right here. So anything from 16 to 60 volts. And this barrel plug fits in right here. So this wire came with the Max Oak. All right, everything is zeroed out. So I'm going to go ahead and flip it. The lights just flipped on. You hear the fan for the Blue Eddy, and it'll ramp itself up. Now we're discharging, and we can see that over here. It says 412 watts. This says 419 watts. And this says 390 watts. So this is reading a little bit low. We've now verified it with two other meters. All right, so it looks like the math says that whatever this is reading, I have to multiply by 1.07. What that tells me is the last time that I got 1.93 out of this battery, if I multiply that, I get just a hair over two kilowatt hours out of this pack. So that would be a little bit more reasonable. Uh, exactly what they're advertised as. They're advertised between two and 2.2 kilowatt hours. Well, we finally shut off and the alarm is under voltage protection, so that would, would have been 2.8, and now we're just bouncing a little bit back. So the BMS uh, shut itself off at 2.8 volts for the lowest cell. We got 1.95 kilowatt hours, uh, so we did just a little bit better, but nothing to write home about. After running two tests, I think it's fair to say that these are two kilowatt hour modules. That means they have two thirds of the original capacity left in them. Let's run through some numbers together. As built, as you see it in the video, I bought two of these batteries from Battery Hookup. I used my discount code, David Paz, and I paid the $350 for shipping. Uh, now these worked out to $230 per kilowatt hour, as you see it in the video. Now let's go back to something that I did during the teardown. When I was showing that you could rotate the cells and parallel the cell groups together, I got really excited. The reason is that we could actually put these together. So this giant module becomes a 2S 7P. And I would regroup all of these to be parallel and all of these to be parallel, and that would make it a 2S. Look at cell number one through seven. You see how they vary? Well, all of those would be averaged out at this point. If you paralleled these, then you get more capacity overall and you'd average out this cell group. So that's really exciting because then you could stack seven of these modules together to create a 14S battery. Uh, it would be then a 14 kilowatt hour battery and you could use one giant BMS like this uh, to compare it in size to the 100 amp BMS. Uh, here you go. <laughs> They're quite a bit different in size. Uh, but you could purchase one large one. It would be mounted externally and you would run the voltage sense wires with ring terminals straight off from the posts. Now when you do it that way, you're saving a little bit on shipping per module because it's still a fixed $350 and it will come out to $143 per kilowatt hour. Now that's a savings of 38% over the way that I built it here in this video. If I did this again, knowing what I know now, I would go that way. Uh, I think this would be really well suited for a home backup system where your house is on the grid uh, most of the time, 99% of the time, 
but every so often you get power outages and this could be hooked up to an automatic uh, transfer switch and uh, probably built into the inverter but once in a while you have a power outage and this can then uh, back that up. I think that's a really good situation for these However, if you are completely off-grid and fully charging them with solar every day and fully discharging them with, uh, every night, uh, that's a full cycle. I don't think you're going to get more than two years out of these. Uh, they're pretty well degraded and uh, I don't think they're best situated for that, for that daily hard cycling. Well, please let me know in the comments below if you like the video, if you like the longer format. I really try to answer all of these questions I keep getting over and over about wiring the BMS and uh, how to do capacity testing. Uh, so I hope this video helps you all out. Thank you so much. Uh, like, subscribe, comment, and share. It really does help the channel. Thank you.